Please welcome Matt Burke. Thank you very much. How's that sound? Good? All right. So one of the most important things when you're speaking, it's really not about you. It's about who you follow. Uh, I'm kind of screwed right now, to tell you the truth. Um, so the good thing is, you know, that, I mean, that was amazing, Father. I mean, amazing. So we're going we're gonna to dumb it down a little bit and talk a little bit about football. Um, yeah. I learned, I learned a long time ago. I mean, I'm not going to try to match that. I learned a long time ago to stick with what you know. I was actually I was in college. I went to Harvard University. Yes, Harvard University does have a football team. And they like everything. Harvard likes to win at everything. So they like to win football games. So, you know, they let football, the, the standards for letting football players in is a little bit lower than for everybody else. <laughs> but I got there as a freshman. We were practicing for a couple weeks in training camp. And then it was time to enroll for classes. It was like, oh, yeah, that's right. We got to go to class. So we were uh, a bunch of us freshmen were huddled in the, in the corner of the locker room going through the course catalog trying to figure out what classes we should take. And, an upperclassman walked by and he said, hey, you guys, take this class. It's called the Bible. It's like, really? There's a class called the Bible at Harvard? You know, 12 years of Catholic school. I knew a little bit about the Bible. So I said, well, why should we take that? He said, oh, this old guy, he's been teaching it forever. And, uh, and your whole grade is based on the final. And the final is the same every year. It's just, it's just one question. And uh, so you never have to go to class and you'll get a good grade. I said, great, I just need to know one more thing. What's the question? <laughs> and he said, oh, he just, you know, he, said, he just has you write an essay about Paul's travels. I said, great. So we all signed up for it, walked into class, big lecture hall the first day, um, sat in the front, you know, got the syllabus, and he said, your whole grade, the old guy gets up there, your whole grade's going to be based on the final, but you got to be sure you come to class every week because you don't know what we're going to test on. And Okay, sure. <laughs> Left that day, never went back. All right. So night before the final, 20 football players, Together and uh, you know we we hunkered down and really, really mastered Paul's travels. You know, spent a good hour on it or so, and then <laughs> you know, they say it's important. You know, get a good night's rest, wake up, get a good breakfast, all that. Did all that. Walked in that final feeling good. I mean, feeling bulletproof, right? Sat in the front again. <laughs> Guys, probably thinking, who are these guys? Sat in the front again, and he gets up there. He says, for the final, there's only there's only one question. You know, we're kind of looking around at each other like. I want you to write an essay. I want you to critique Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> I mean, you want to talk about panic setting in? Like, the panic where, like, the back of your knees starts sweating a little bit? My first thought was, how am I going to tell my parents I failed a class called the Bible? <laughs> and my second question, my second thought was, am I going to be eligible for spring football? <laughs> so for, like, 15, 20 minutes, I'm trying to think, I'm racking my brain about the Sermon on the Mount, and, you know, and there's not much coming back. So it was kind of an exercise in futility, so I just said, screw it. And I got up, and I, I just turned my, my blue book in and kind of did the walk of shame out of the lecture hall, and all the other guys kind of followed suit. We went back to the, to the commons area, and we were, we were sitting around commiserating, you know, oh, woe is us. What are the chances he changes the question the year that we take the class, you know? And we're there for an hour, hour and a half, just kind of just feeling sorry for ourselves, and Thought everybody was there, but one of our guys was missing. And he comes walking in, and this guy, his name was Chris Schaefer, but we never called him Chris Schaefer. We called him, we called him The Tick, because he was 5'9", 300 pounds, so he walked, kind of walked like this. <laughs> it's just how football people talk to each other. And, uh, and he was a defensive lineman, he was nose tackle, right? Not, not bright. So uh, <laughs> he, was, he was smiling. I said, Tick, where you been? He said, oh, man, I just got out of the final. I said, what do you mean you just got out of the final? What were you doing? Were you sleeping? He said, no, no, I was writing the whole time. I said, what were you writing? You know, we, 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 studied, we studied Paul's travels. It was on the Sermon on the Mount. He said, oh, it was easy. I just put, who am I to critique Jesus' Sermon on the Mount? Let me tell you about Paul's travels. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to stick with what I know. Uh, I got to imagine, just real quick, I got to imagine there's some, there's some Ravens fans in here, Baltimore Ravens fans, yeah? All right. Are there, I suppose there's probably some Redskins fans too. All right, all right. I'll speak slowly so you guys can keep up. <laughs> football, football is one of the most important, unimportant things in our culture, right? It's not your faith, it's not your family, 
It's not your job. It's not your friends. But it's, it's probably too important in our society, right? Unfortunately, more people are probably, more people watching football than going to Mass on Sundays. Their, their team, their football team, it's a bigger, it's more important. They spend more time, they spend all week thinking about and talking about and reading about their team than they do about their faith. But for me, football holds a very special place in my life because it's what brought me back. What people don't realize is football is a very spiritual game. Every team I ever played on, high school, college, professional, we always, as a team, took a knee, said an Our Father before the game, said an Our Father after the game. Whether, whether the coach, and most, most people in football are Christians, yeah, I mean, you almost have to be, because it's, it's really hard. Football's a really hard game, and the further up you get, the harder it gets, right? So I joke around, I say, I say football saved more people than Billy Graham. Because sooner or later, sooner or later, football's going to bring you to your knees. So you might as well, you might as well start there, right? And that, here's my story. I grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota. St. Paul, Minnesota. <laughs> it's pretty Catholic. Used to be, at least. Pretty Catholic. Catholic grade school, Catholic high school. Born to two devout parents. Was given the gift of faith as a child. But like a lot of gifts, we don't always appreciate them, right? But I can honestly say I never once missed Mass through high school. I mean, my dad, we would be up north, we'd be at a cabin or camping or whatever, and this is pre-Google and all that, right? This is the 80s, and we would get in the car Sunday morning, drive to some town I'd never heard of, and always, we would just pull up in front of the Catholic Church 10 minutes before Mass started. It was, like, amazing. You know, my dad had, like, this internal Mass schedule thing. He was, <laughs> he, actually, he actually spent a couple years in the seminary. Um, you know, fortunately for me, he dropped out, but... Uh, <laughs> Discerned out, discerned out, that's what we say, discerned out, not dropped out. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I was, I was taught by the nuns, and I knew, I knew that I was a child of God. I knew who made me, I knew what he did for me, and I knew what he expected of me, right? And it was kind of, I mean, it was pretty, it was easy being Catholic, right? Went to a Catholic high school that was, eh, sort of Catholic, you know, like, too, unfortunately, like too many of our Catholic high schools are, it was sort of Catholic. But when I went away to college, you know, my, uh, my parents, they just dropped me at the airport. I had two duffel bags. That was, that was everything I had, everything I needed. They dropped me at the curb and said, you know, good luck. We'll come visit you when we can, you know, when we, when we can scrape together the money and come visit you. So flew out to college, practiced football that whole first week. Sunday was our off day. I woke up Sunday morning in the dorm room with seven other guys, and I'm kind of looking around, and I'm kind of thinking, well, like, when are we going go to when are we gonna go to church? Nobody was talking about going to church, and... I didn't say anything, and I didn't go. First time ever in my life that I missed Mass on Sunday. And it, it was hard. I felt a lot of guilt, Catholic guilt. Um, practiced the whole second week. Wake up the second Sunday morning at college. Didn't go to Mass. Wasn't as hard the second time. And it got a lot easier. This became, this became the pattern for me. And I thought, well, you know, I... I've been to church, you know, I know all that stuff. Plus, everybody was telling me, everybody was telling me how good I was doing, right? Gosh, you're doing great, we're so proud of you, you know, you're at a great college, you're playing, you're doing great, right? Everybody's slapping me on the back, like slapping me on the back, sending me straight to hell, you know, I mean, it was like, because <laughs> I was thinking I was doing great, you know, I was, I was killing it, right? And I got into this where, where, where I was internally, it was like, well, you know, but I'm a good person, you know, I'm not hurting anybody, Right? We, I mean, we do that a lot. I'm a good person. I know right from wrong. But I was only looking out for number one. I wasn't stepping on number two, but I was only looking out for number one. My life was all about me, and it was all about these temporal things, right? These worldly things, right? Achievements. So a couple months ago, by and then my mom, just my mom, came out to visit. My mom grew up on a dairy farm. I mean, I don't think she'd, she never thought she'd have a son that went to Harvard. I never thought, I mean, I never when, when, the, when the admissions letter came, it said I got in. She said, are you sure, that the, are you sure that's a real letter? Are you sure that's, <laughs> huh? I said, yeah. So she shows up. So she's proud as can be, and I'm taking her on a tour. And, and I end the tour in the middle of Harvard Yard, which is a pretty, yeah, it's a pretty iconic place. It's a big deal. And we're in the middle of Harvard Yard, and I said, Mom, there's Widener Library. Widener Library is the biggest library in the world. They have the most books, back when we used to have books, right? They have the most books of any library in the world. Like, that was a big deal, okay? I said, that's where I go and study at night. That was the first lie I told her. 
The second lie I told her was, and there's Memorial Church, right? And that's where I go to church on Sunday. She said, oh, that's great. So I went to football practice. She kept walking around. I met her later that night for dinner, and I said, well, how was the rest of your day? She said, oh, it was, it was great. I went inside the library. I said, oh, yeah, isn't it awesome? It's so big. There's all sorts of nice, quiet places to, to study in there. And she said, yeah, she goes, then I went into Memorial Church. I said, oh, it's great. You should hear the music on Sundays, Mom. It's just, it's just beautiful. She said, yeah, that's not a Catholic church. <laughs> that would have been good to know, right? I mean... Growing up in St. Paul, Minnesota, I just assumed everybody was white, Irish, and Catholic. I mean, I didn't know. I had no idea. Not only did I not really know my faith all that well, but I didn't have any idea of these other faiths. I mean, there's one Jewish kid in my neighborhood. I just thought, well, he kind of gets the short end of the stick at Christmas. I mean, but I didn't know. I didn't know what it meant to be Catholic. And so, of course, I, it feels real bad when you get caught in a lie with your mom. But she left, and I just kind of kept, you know, kept on my ways, right? Man, I'm doing good, I'm doing good, I'm a good person. And I'd come home and, of course, go to Mass with them, but I wasn't living my faith. And then after college, i get drafted by my hometown team, the Minnesota Vikings, right? When I was growing up, I mean, there, there was only one game on TV then. That's the only game, it's the only, it's the only team you watch. So, I mean, I was a huge Vikings fan, and i get drafted by the Vikings. And, again, now I come home and everyone's like, gosh, you're doing great, you're doing great, right? I'm thinking, I don't... I don't need church, right? God, you know, God, you and me, we're good. We're good, right? We're good. A couple years go by, things go really well. I signed the biggest contract in the history of the NFL for a center. I mean, I had, I had more worldly success than I, than I could ever even dream to be impossible. Because when I grew up, I was, I, was pretty, I was pretty average in every way, athletically, academically, socially. It's just like I, I played all these sports growing up. I wasn't good at any of them. And then in the 10th grade, I decided, well, I've tried everything else. I might as well go out for football. And that's when I really discovered the gifts that God gave me. He gave me the gift of getting in people's way and grabbing onto them. <laughs> not, not holding onto them, grabbing onto them. It's a, very, it's a very nuanced difference, okay? But I had more world's least success than, than I ever dreamed possible. And everyone's saying, gosh, you're great, must be great, Bob. Yeah, yeah, it's great. And on the inside, I was dying. I was dying. I mean, I was, I was so big time. I had a hamburger, still, I still have a hamburger named after me at a bar in St. Paul. If you're a lineman and you got a hamburger named after you, that's about as big as it gets, like, right? <laughs> Maybe a pizza, but other than that, I mean, that's a big deal. But I was dying on the inside. I was trying to, I was trying to fill my heart with, with, and I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And so I always say it's funny, or God works in mysterious ways. I met this woman. I became rather smitten with her. Um, we got married. And when I got married, I had a drug problem. My wife drugged me to church. <laughs> and it was kind of like, oh, yeah, OK. I was like, yeah, I remember this. All right. And you know, you know, you're married. Father, you're talking about you know, you're married. And you're like, OK, you know, life is getting, now it's different, right? It's like, it's another level of seriousness. I'm married, but. And then we had a child, and that's when my life changed. When I saw my daughter being born, first of all, I knew. I said, that right there, that's God. That is a miracle. I just witnessed a miracle. I mean, the whole, it's a miracle. Just because something happens millions of times a day doesn't mean it's not a miracle, right? I witnessed a miracle. And from, obviously, I said, from now, I'll be a father now for the from now on to the rest of my life. My life is forever changed. So that was in the summer. She was born on July 10th, okay? So now we go to training camp. Now, I said football is a spiritual game. Every team I ever played on had a team chaplain who was there all the time. Three of the four head coaches I played for were Catholic, so we had Catholic mass either Saturday nights or Sundays in the hotel. We always stay in a hotel night before the game, home or away. Um, but the, the team chaplain's always there. Doors always open. There's player Bible studies on... Mondays, there's couples Bible studies on Thursday nights, there's Saturday nights, there's a fellowship service. It's probably one of the few workplaces in the world where you're actually, you're actually encouraged to grow in your faith, you know? Half the guys in their lockers, they've got, they got Bibles on the shelf. It's just, it's very common, right? I mean, it's there. It's there inside the game. So I had a roommate, his name was Corey Withrow, he was the backup center, and, uh, you know, you guys get to the hotel and 
you got a couple hours before meetings the night before a game, so we'd always order room service, watch a movie, whatever. And he would always get up a half hour before meetings and grab his Bible and go to Bible study. And the first, first day he did this, when we were rookies, he said, hey, you want to go to Bible study? And I was like, uh, no, I'm thinking to myself, I don't go to Bible study, I'm, I'm Catholic, you know. <laughs> it's true, that's what I was thinking. Was, but every, every Saturday night, you get up, hey, you want to go to Bible study? No, I'm good, very respectful. Well, now, I was changed, things are different, I had a child now. So he said, hey, you want to go to Bible study? I said, yeah. And he's like, really? And I said, yeah, you finally wore me down, let's go. So, we go to Bible, this is the first Bible study meeting of the year, right, and there's about 12 guys there, and we're all sitting around the, the chaplain, and he says, all right, yeah, this is great, guys, you know, we're going to have a great year, let's just, you know, start off, we've got some new guys, let's, let's go around, I want everybody to talk about, you know, t- tell us your story, tell us about the day that you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and I was like, huh, I was like, I've kind of heard that language before, not, not in a Catholic sense, we don't talk like that, but I'd kind of heard it, because most guys in the NFL, most guys are are evangelical, Protestant, you know, I'm come from the South, or whatever, so, so I was sitting over here, and luckily he started over here, right, and kind of went around the room, and every single one of these guys had a date and a year when they accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. I think, well, what am I going to say, you know, I don't, I don't have a date, I don't know, I could, you know, my daughter was born, but I, so he got to me, and I, I just said, well, I said, I'm a Catholic, so I guess, I accepted Jesus Christ when the day I was baptized. And I could see the team chaplain. He was kind of, gave me a little like, (laughs) (laughs) silly Catholics, you know. Uh, So when we we broke, he's like, hey, stay here, Matt. We we talked a little bit. um, He said, hey, I'd like to to meet once a week with you. You know, let's have breakfast once a week and just just talk. I said, hey, that sounds great. And... uh, so I get to know this guy a little bit, and I asked him, I said, so, where, so like, what religion are you? Where do you go to church? And for some reason, you know, I don't know why, but I still identified with being Catholic. Maybe it was out of respect to my parents. Maybe it was the, the seeds that were, that were sown you know, way back in grade school with the, with the nuns. I don't know, but it was, for some, it was still important. Even though I wasn't practicing, I, it was still important to me that I was Catholic. I was proud of that for some reason, right? I said, well, where, Tom, I said, where, I said, where'd you go? Where do you go to church? He goes, well, I used to be Catholic. But then a priest said some things that contradicted the Bible, and I knew he wasn't right, so I left, and I'm, you know, what? I said, oh, okay. What happened was he was really challenging me on my Catholic faith. And I was not equipped at all to answer his questions, to defend the faith. So I, I kind of went on this quest, and I said, well, he's challenging me, and things are serious now. We have a child. I better figure out, I better figure out what I am. I better go on my, on my own quest, quest for truth. And thankfully I did that, and, and thankfully God put all these resources in my life and, and made it rather simple for me to find, to, to rediscover the truth that the Catholic Church is the Church of Christ. And it is the pillar of truth, as it says in the Bible. So I think at some point, the point is, I know a lot of you have kids and grandkids and I have kids, and you pray a lot. I talk to a lot of parents who say, well, I have kids that have left the faith. And at some point, we all have to, the choice is made for us. If we're cradle Catholics, the choice is made for us when we're baptized, when we're, when we're, when we're babies. But at some point, we all have to reclaim the faith as our own. The se- second can, right? we, have to, we have to make it our own. And so that's what, that's what I did. I probably had 10 conversions since then, and I'll have 100, 100 more, right? Because it's not, it's, not it's not a, I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior on this day, and now I'm saved, right? It doesn't, it, we know it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work. That's not, what, that's not what we believe. Every single day, we have to take up the cross. Every single day, we have to give our lives to God. But here's the one thing I really appreciate about the faith, right? So I was, told you I was drafted in 1998 by the Vikings, um, I mean, I was, I, it was April, okay, we have mini camp in April, so I'm getting ready to walk into the locker room for the first time as a member of this team. I mean, four months before this, I'm in my dorm room watching this team, you know, cheering them on, throwing stuff at the TV at the end of the season, which is how all Viking seasons end. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And now, I'm getting, and now I'm getting ready to walk in as a member of this team. And so I just take a deep breath and I open the door. And right when I open the door, there's four guys sitting there right by a locker. Four guys just drinking coffee. Randall McDaniel, who's in the Hall of Fame. Chris Carter, who's in the Hall of Fame. John Randall, who's in the Hall of Fame. And Jeff Christie, who is just the, he's not in the Hall of Fame. He was just the starting center at the time making Pro Bowls, right? So my first thought is, I wonder what the policy is on autographs. <laughs> <coughs> I was like, all right, I was like, play it cool, play it cool. I walk, hey guys, what's up, you know? I find my locker, I get to my locker, I got a name up above, I got a jersey, helmet, shoes, socks, I mean, everything in there, and, there's a, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a playbook sitting on my stool. This is 1998, there's no iPads, it's a playbook, right? And those of you that are old enough to remember, which most of you look like you are, remember the old, <laughs> like the old phone books, when they deliver the phone books to your house, right? They were like this thick? Well, that's an NFL playbook. That, that's an NFL offensive playbook. Okay? Defensive playbook, there's only one page. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. And a defensive playbook is just a picture of the football and it says, go get it, boys. <laughs> it's in. Is all right? But there's this big, thick book, you know? A big, thick book. Catholics, we know about big, thick books, right? It's a little intimidating, but I was like, good, there's a book. At least there's something here I can, I can, I know how to study a little bit, you know? So I grabbed Go to, I went to the meeting, and when I say 1998, if you're a Vikings fan, you would, you would cringe because that team ended up being the most prolific offense in the history of the NFL at the time. We drafted a guy named Randy Moss that year. He was pretty good. Scored 17 <laughs> touchdowns as a rookie. I mean, we blew out everybody. But I went to that meeting, and it wasn't like I was, it wasn't like we were starting on page one. You know, hey, here's how we huddle, and here's how we, these guys were so advanced. I mean, this, this, it, we knew we were going to be good. They, they were like, they didn't even open the book. These guys are like making up offense, drawing it up on the board as we go along. They're inventing offense, and I'm, where, where's this, where's this in the book, you know? I sat in a meeting for two hours. I didn't learn anything, right? I didn't feel like I knew anything. And then we go out on the practice field, and we're practicing, and I'm just kind of, you know, feel like I'm at fantasy camp, running around, trying not to trip anybody, and then we get into this scrimmage situation, offense against defense. And I remember I was sitting there watching the first string offense go against the first string defense, and I was like, man. These guys are really good. Like, we didn't have guys like this at Yale or Brown or this is the NFL. This guy's, and I was just kind of in awe of these guys. And then my coach says, all right, get in there. I was like, oh, yeah. Okay, so I run in the huddle, and I'm hyperventilating a little bit. And I just remember thinking, I just hope I know if it's a run or a pass when he calls. No, that wasn't even a joke. I was serious. That's all. I was like, is it a run or a pass? And so Brad Johnson, our quarterback, steps in the huddle, and I was like, whoa, man, wait till I tell my buddies I'm in the huddle with Brad Johnson. This is sweet. <laughs> and he calls the play, and I, I knew it was a pass, right? So I break the huddle, come up to the line of scrimmage, I'm feeling good. And there's John Randall. Okay, I got to play with the greatest, you know, great, I mean, guys that are in the Hall of Fame, guys that are going to be in the Hall of Fame, the all-time greats. John Randall's the best football player I've ever seen. And I, I knew he was good, but... I was like, this is great. My first play in the NFL, I'm going against John Randall, right? I'm going against the best. And this is going to be good because even though I'd only been there a short time, guys already, they're already making fun of me. They always make fun of the rookies, but they're making fun of me. They're like, oh, you went to Harvard? You know, does Harvard even have a football team? And I was like, yeah, we got uniforms and everything, man. It's great. <laughs> it's like real football, you know? So I was like, good. First play, I said, I'm going to lock John Randall down, you know, right? And no one's going to make, any, make fun of me anymore. So I'm down in my stance. So what you want to do as an offensive lineman is you want to punch the defensive lineman in his chest to stop, stop his momentum, right? Well, I wasn't going to punch John Randall in his chest. This is going to be like the greatest play in the history of the NFL. So I was going to, come, I was going to punch so hard my hands were going to go through John's chest and come out his back. That's how, <laughs> that's how hard I was going to punch him, right? So down there, ball snapped. I come out, I went, and I punched as hard as I could. But I closed my eyes because I was pretty scared. <laughs> John Randall's a bad man. He used to paint his face black, black all over here, and he'd bark like a dog, and he was, he's a scary guy. So I closed my eyes, and I didn't feel anything. <laughs> and that's a bad feeling for an offensive lineman, because <laughs> your job is essentially getting that guy's way, right? And I opened my eyes, and John was no longer standing there. He was like, here you know, on his way to the quarterback. So this is going to be the greatest play in the history of the NFL turned into a, turned into a lookout block where it just went, look out. 
So Brad drops back, and all of a sudden, you know, John's on him right away. And obviously, you don't tackle the quarterback in practice. And D lineman, you're just supposed to just run by the quarterback. We can see that you beat your guy, but everybody else is out here practicing. You know, other linemen and receivers and cornerbacks, and you know, we're practicing. We're trying to get better, right? So, well, John, because it was April, and he probably thought it was funny that you know I'm standing still still standing by the by the line of scrimmage, and he's already at the quarterback. So as he's running by Brad, he slapped him on the slapped him on the, like, the hip butt area really hard, you know, just to be funny. Um, but it wasn't funny to Brad because it hurt. I mean, you could tell, like, stung because Brad kind of let out a ah like that. And then he broke his concentration, and he just took the ball, and he threw it down in the ground. So that's what we call a wasted rep. You know, football coaches hate wasted reps. It's like a mortal sin of football, right? Because we didn't, we didn't get any better. We just wasted a minute, and we didn't get any better. So... John's back there laughing, you know, he's like, ha, 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 and, and Brad's, you know, walking away, cursing under his breath, whatever, and coaches are yelling and screaming at me, and I'm just thinking, thank goodness I got my degree, because <laughs> I, can't, I, I can't do this. I mean, I thought I could. I was like, when I got, I'm like, man, I'm going to play here for 10 years, and I'm going to make a career out of this, and, and in one, one play, I was like, I can't do this. So the rest of the practice went on. It didn't get much better. And afterwards, the coach is kind of walking with me off the field. He's like, well, how did it go out there today? I said, ah, you know, it was OK. He says, no, it wasn't. <laughs> My offensive line coach, he was from Long Island. You know, he was, uh, he was 6'8", kind of looked like Frankenstein. He wasn't like the warm, cuddly guy. He's like, no, it wasn't. I was like, well, I did some good things. Said, no, you didn't. <laughs> He's like, look, here's the deal. He's like, you're not good enough to play tackle. Tackle is where the really good offensive linemen play. I was like, okay, that's kind of a quick decision to make, but he's like, you're not going to be a guard either. I was like, you didn't even try me at guard. How do you know? <laughs> he goes, your, your only chance is to play center. I was like, okay. Um, well, what do I got? He goes, you ever snapped a football before? I said, no. He goes, be out here five minutes early before practice this afternoon, and the quarterbacks, you practice snapping the football. Okay? So I'm out there like 20 minutes early. You know, I'm like, come on, you can do this, you can do this. And, Waiting, 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 and then here come the quarterbacks five minutes before practice starts. A little bit less enthused about what's going to happen. Um, you know, Brad was there, and I was like, oh, I wonder if Brad remembers what happened this morning. <laughs> and Brad's a really nice guy, and I was like, hey, Brad. And Brad was like, hey. It's like, all right, Brad hates me. And then we had, we had Randall Cunningham on our team. Randall Cunningham was my fifth grade fantasy football quarterback. I was like, man, this is like, we got everybody on this team. It's like a team of all stars, you know? And for five minutes, all we did was practice snapping the football. Right? You just bend over, put your hand on the ball. Quarterback puts his hands underneath you. Takes a little getting used to. All right? <laughs> 15 years, never quite got used to it. But if you can't play tackle or guard, you better learn how to play center. And for five minutes, we just practiced snapping the football. The chances are if you watch football, like in person or on your couch, you never, you've never like hit the person next to you and say, Oh my gosh, did you see that? Did you see how the center snapped the ball? It was perfect. The laces were just perfect. How does he do that? No, the only time you notice the snap is when? Yeah, it's on the ground or over his head, and then it's always the center's fault, never the quarterback's fault. <laughs> how about a little accountability once in a while, guys? Jeez Louise, you make all the money, whatever. So, right? No, the only time you notice is when it's bad. But the snap, we practiced it every single day. For 15 years, I went out five minutes early and practiced snapping the football. It's that important. Later on that year in training camp, when things are ratcheted up a little bit, and now you kind of got, you're practicing for a purpose. John was, John was over me. I was playing center. He's beating me to the right. He's beating me to the left. He's running me over, and he's all in my head. And I start, I put a couple snaps on the ground. And our coach, our head coach, the head coach, when the head coach calls a lineman over, it's not good. Head coach don't want to talk to linemen. Like, he don't, want, he, don't, he don't want to deal with you, right? He got to deal with all these other guys, all these attitude, prima donna guys. He don't want, so he calls me over, Denny Green, he says, Matt, you have to get the ball to the quarterback. Your number one job as a center is get the ball to the quarterback. Just make sure you do that. I don't care if you don't block anybody. I said, well, I'm not really blocking anybody now. So I, <laughs> the least I can do is get the ball to the quarterback, right? It's that important, though, right? So after that, then the whistle blows and practice officially starts, okay? So they send the linemen all the way down into the corner. You don't, we don't even get to, like, stay on the field. We get, like, the bad grass off the field. 
the court, uh, receivers and running backs and all them use the good stuff. And they send us down in a little area about the size of this stage. And we get in these things called chutes, okay? If you don't know what a chute is, it's like a big rectangular box, but it's just a metal frame. You come out of your stance and if you rise up, you hit your head on one of the bars. It makes a loud noise and all your buddies make fun of you. But it teaches you to stay low because leverage is really important in, in line play. They say the low man, low man wins. I knew if I played quarterback, this would be a lot more interesting talk. But this is, this is what it's like to be a lineman, okay? So stay with me, all right? Leverage, right? And then, and then it gets super, super complicated, okay? Then we get these things called boards. They're 10 foot long boards, one foot wide. And we put those in the chutes. And you straddle those, and you get in the chute, and you come out, and the board teaches you to keep, you have to keep your feet apart, because if you put your feet together, then you get knocked over, okay? I'm pretty sure that the NFL, this is like the highest level of football, right? There is no like super NFL or anything like that. Every single day, we practice snapping the football. We went down in the corner, got in the chutes, and came out on the boards. For 15 years, I did that. I coached third grade football and fifth grade football. Yeah, I'm a bad parent. My kids play tackle football, okay? We do the same thing. We do the same thing. Why? Because the fundamentals never, ever change. A hundred years from now when they're playing football, I guarantee you the centers will be out there five minutes early practice snapping and the linemen are going to go down into the corner and get in the chutes and come out on the boards. Because the fundamentals never change. What changes is the attention that we pay to them. Right? It's kind of human nature to say, oh, I got that. I've done that. I know that. Like, what's next? No, no. This is really all there is. All these guys I played with who were in the Hall of Fame, were they talented? Yeah but everybody's talented in the NFL. What set them apart? What made them great Hall of Fame football players? They were maniacal about mastering the fundamentals. That was almost like they're more so than, it's not like, hey, we're just, because I want to win and, 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 and we're good, like we're just going to go out there, we're just going to make it happen, we're just going to go win. No, no, football, it's all about 99% you know, preparation. You only have 16 games a year. It's, it was almost like their, their purpose for existing was every day I'm going to master these fundamentals, right? That was, that, was, that was who they were. So fast forward 15 years from that first day to my last day in the NFL. I was playing in the Super Bowl. So, you know, they tell you, oh, Super Bowl, it's a big deal. It's going to change your life. There's a billion people watching, blah, blah, blah. Who won the Super Bowl three years ago? I can't remember either, but they say it's a big deal when you're going to do it, all right? You can just say Patriots. I'm sure that's probably who wanted it, okay? <laughs> Safe bet. So we actually beat the Patriots at their place, thumped them. That felt pretty good. And now we come back to Baltimore. We got 13 days before the Super Bowl, which is kind of weird because we're used to, we kind of live on these seven-day life cycles, and now we've got 13 days. And our offense coordinator comes in. He says, hey, guys, great job. Just so you know, first play we're going to run in the Super Bowl is dot right 40 gut. Dot right 40 gut does not sound like a very complicated play because it's not. It's like a day one running play. Everybody runs it. My third grade team runs it. It's about all we run, okay? The running back just steps to the right, gets the handoff. All the linemen take a step to the right. You block the guy that's in your gap, and the running back just finds a, finds a, finds a hole. So it's kind of weird. It's like, one, this is the Super Bowl, and we're going out with dot right 40 gut. It's like, did you stay up all night trying to think of this, or what's the deal? <laughs> Like, don't we need to run some flea flicker, triple reverse? Or... And the second thing that was interesting was they never told us the first play a week or two weeks before the game. It's always the night before the game. They give you a script with the first 15 plays, and they say, here's our first 15. You know, see you tomorrow. So whatever, we practiced all week in Baltimore, and then we went to New Orleans, and, um, and uh, you know, this, it was a super where the lights went out, right? Everybody remembers that one. So, because that never happens. And... The whole week in New Orleans, you're just kind of hoping nobody gets arrested, right? That like everybody gets to the game on time, and we get to the game on time, and it's God Bless America, and the national anthem, and flyovers, and then there's like a kickoff, and then there's more commercials, and we're all just kind of waiting, waiting, waiting out on the field, and just saying, man, there's another five million bucks that the NFL just made for that 30 seconds, another five million, and yeah, you, know, you just, and finally it's time to go. The referee's like, all right, here, let's go. And our quarterback, Joe Flacco, steps in the huddle, he says, guys, you already know. On one. Ready, break. And we went up, we ran dot right 40, got. That was a pretty unspectacular play. I think we got two and a half. Let's call it three yards, because my guy made the tackle. So three yards we got. It's a good run. And 
That was it. But here's the point. Back then, way back then, six years ago, if we'd had a drone over the field videoing this, right, video that play, and then if you were to run that film back and you were to remove everybody from the stands and everybody, all the coaches and players on the sidelines and all the other players on the field except me and run that film, you know what I was doing? I was snapping the football, I was in the shoots, and I was coming out on the boards. All I was trying to do was execute the fundamentals that I had spent the last 15 years trying to perfect. I wasn't trying to do something superhuman. I wasn't, trying to do, I wasn't relying on just my, my God-given talent or just going to somehow make it happen. I was just telling myself, and it was pretty comforting to tell you the truth because it's pretty nerve-wracking saying, well, if there are a billion people watching and if I screw something up, you know, that's, that's heady stuff, right? Like, that's, that's how I'm going to be remembered. All I was saying, I just kept telling myself, just go execute your fundamentals. That's what I was clinging to, right? It's all about the fundamentals. And that's what's great about our faith. We've got it. We've got it all right here. Huh? We've got, obviously, we have the mass. We have the rosary. We have confession. We have adoration. We, we, I would say, too, we do, we've, got the, we've got the Hall of Fame. When you're a young player, it's great to have a guy, an older guy who, on film who does it right way. Coaches used to say, that's what it looks like. Do it like that. We know what it looks like. We've got the, we have all these fundamentals at our disposal to do over and over and over. And mastering the fundamentals, that's what makes you a great football player. That's what makes you a great Catholic, right? Knowing is not enough. To know is, is nothing. We have to do, right? And we can just keep doing these things over and over and over. And to me, that's what, that's, what, that's what greatness is. That's what greatness is. So I think, too, I, I love events like this. One, fraternity is very important. But especially today, right here, right now. Um, it's on us. It's on us, man. And these are Catholic men in this room, right? So, one, we have to know our faith. Two, we got to understand, nobody ever left. I mean, I'm so tired of hearing about, you know, falling away Catholics and it's the largest group. Of, that's fine. Guess what? Nobody's ever left the Catholic faith because it was too easy, right? It's hard to be Catholic. That's good. I think that's what kind of defines us, right? It's not, the, not to well, make fun of any other faith too much, but I mean, I just was, you know, this whole, I, I believe, therefore I'm saved. I mean, you can say you believe, but that's, we know it's not, it's not even in the Bible, right? Faith without works is dead. We do. We do. We don't mind it being hard. You got to be tough to be a Catholic, especially these days. And you know what? With the, with the, I mean, our church will be fine. The sins of man has been trying to take down the church for 2,000 years, you know? It, the church will prevail. We all know that. But we can't just sit, sit on the sideline and say, oh, yeah, it'll be fine. Because you know what? With all the things that's going on in our culture, and don't get it twisted, there is a war on Catholics in our culture and with what's going on inside our church. There are not enough. There's a lot of good priests and bishops out there, but there's not enough. There's not enough to pull us out of this right now. It's on the laity, and it's on the men. Right? We have sexualized and marginalized women so much. It is on the men right now to help lead us out of this darkness. So what do we do? One, you have to pray. So often, and, and I'm, I'm as guilty, I'm guilty too. I'm not preaching to anybody. I'm, I'm talking to myself first and foremost. But we do all these things in the name of God, yet we forget to pray. Like we leave him out of it. It starts with prayer. I'm talking about adoration. A year and a half ago, I was, I was in the back of the church. I mean, the, so in our, it's like the way back of the church. Like where I'm, I'm in like the cheap seats, the nosebleeds, because I got the little ones and, you know, we're like outside the church. We have to hear it through the, the PA system. And our, and our pastor's up there. He said, hey, you know, in the back of church today, you can sign up for, we have perpetual adoration. You can sign up for, for adoration. Um, and I was like, wow, geez, I mean, come on. I got all these kids, and I'm, this, I'm, I'm busy, you know. And he said, if you think you're too busy, maybe you need to think about, uh, maybe you need to think about where, where your priorities are at if you can't give one hour a week to Jesus. And I was like, wow, is he like, is he really blind? Like, what's, what's going on, right? Sign up for one hour of holy uh, adoration. It will, it will change your life, okay? Pray. The second, is, the second is do. I think as Catholics, I think what, what, what helps define it is, is we're doers. 
And right now in our society, the, the corporal works of mercy are dead, right? Again, read through the corporal works of mercy. It's not real complicated. I mean, the beauty is, right, you don't have to be smart or good-looking or talented or anything, right? These things we can, all, we can all do. Linemen can do them, right? It's just about doing. Do. If you're not a Knight of Columbus, I know a lot of you are. If you're not, why not? It's an easy way to put your faith into action, to plug in and, and do something, right? And then if, if we pray and we do, I think that's love. And love is God. I think right now the problem we have is there's too many people to, to footballize it because I footballize everything, okay? Um, there's a lot of Catholics who are, they're, 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 they're four-team Catholic. You know, they're wearing the jerseys, but they're in the, you know, they're in the stands, right? They're just kind of, they're lukewarm fans, right? Yeah, you know, things are going good. Yeah, I'm a Catholic, and if not, oh, yeah, well, you know, whatever, right? I mean, I know if you're Redskins fans, you're used to, you're used to losing seasons, right? <laughs> right? It's going to turn around one of these years. No, right? We need more people... You know, get in the game. Get in the game and start doing something. And when I look around at events like this, you know, and everyone wants to talk about the demise of the church, and I look at, you know, get 700 guys to show up here and 1,000 guys here and 500 here, you know what? Church can be just fine, right? But we all got to do our part. And we're all, right here, we're all just the, just the men for the job. So be tough, be strong, and be Catholic. Thank you very much.